Good morning, Skyline. Skyline. Welcome everyone in this time of testing in the great global pandemic of COVID-19 and so much more. And so let us take a moment to stop and listen and breathe and remember all those who cannot breathe. So welcome to every bit of yourself, whether you're old or young or sick or well, or queer or straight, afraid or at peace or a little bit of both, whether you're lonely or just zoomed out, you are welcome. Welcome to people of all colors and genders and body shapes and sizes and all physical and mental abilities and moments. Welcome all of us, each one of you, all of us connected in this Kairos moment, this inflection time where we are all in great need of the Holy Spirit and her wisdom and her power to change us from the inside out, to repair us and to then go forth and repair this world. And so we gather together, made a little more whole through our communion and our sharing together. Today's lectionary reading lifts up the central story to three monotheistic faith traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It is a story of Abraham, the patriarch, Abraham whose descendants from this one family became these three monotheistic faith traditions. Context within Judaism, which Jesus was raised in, is that the story is read as part of Rosh Hashanah, honoring the Jewish New Year. And for those of you who know the story, the binding of Isaac, it can read more like an ending rather than a beginning, but they're very much connected. And so I invite you, as you hear today's reading, to imagine Jesus as a young boy, a young Jewish Palestinian boy growing up, hearing the story for the first time, perhaps from his rabbi. Reading from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14, from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. And, and after all of this, God tested Abraham. God said, Abraham. Yes, answered Abraham, I'm listening. God said, take your dear son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I'll point out to you. Abraham got up early in the morning and saddled his donkey. He took two of his young servants and his son Isaac. Abraham had split wood for the burnt offering. He set out for the place God had directed him. And on the third day, he looked up and he saw the place in the distance. Abraham told his two young servants, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I are going over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and gave it to Isaac, his son, to carry. Abraham carried the flint and the knife. The two of them went off together. Isaac said to Abraham, his father, Father? Yes, my son, we have the flint and wood, 
but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Abraham said, son, God will see to it that there's a sheep for the burnt offering. And they kept walking together. They arrived at the place to which God had directed them. Abraham built an altar. He laid out the wood. Then he tied up Isaac and laid him on the wood. Abraham reached out and took the knife to kill his son. And just then an angel of God called to him out of heaven, Abraham, Abraham, yes, I'm listening. Do not lay a hand on that boy. Do not touch him. Now I know how fearlessly you fear God. You did not hesitate to place your son, your dear son, on the altar for me. Abraham looked up. He saw a ram caught by its horns in the thicket. Abraham took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named that place God Yira, God sees to it. That's where we get the saying, on the mountain of God, he sees to it. So ends our reading. Let us meditate on these words in the sanctuary of our hearts and minds. Please pray with me. Come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts. Kindle us in the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit that we may be renewed and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. In his brilliant autobiography, Rabbi Abraham Heschel describes his first experience of this story, hearing it as a boy told by his rabbi and identifying with the experience of Isaac. Heschel writes, Isaac was on his way to Mount Moriah with his father. Then he lay on the altar bound, waiting to be sacrificed. And my heart began to beat even faster. It actually sobbed with pity for Isaac. Behold, Abraham now lifted the knife and now my heart froze within me with fright. And suddenly the voice of the angel was heard. Abraham, lay not thy hand upon that lad for now I know thou fearest God. And here Heschel says, crying, I broke out into tears. Why are you crying? Asked the rabbi. You know that Isaac was not killed. And I said to the rabbi, still weeping, but rabbi, suppose the angel had come a second too late. The rabbi comforted me and calmed me saying that the angel cannot come late. It's a comforting thought for a young boy, but Heschel concluded the story in his autobiography with the realization that while an angel cannot be late, human beings made of flesh and blood, maybe. Is it too late for us? Rabbi Heschel knew all too well from personal experience that an angel cannot be late, but human beings made of flesh and blood, maybe. Heschel was born in Warsaw, Poland, educated in Berlin, was deported by the Nazis and came to the US deeply conscious of the Holocaust. In the 1960s, he was immersed in the interfaith movement, including civil rights, anti-nuclear proliferation movements, 
and the Vietnam War protests. He wondered if humanity was up to the task of repairing the world, tikkun olam as it's called in Hebrew, or if it faced total annihilation. What if the angel comes a second too late? Are we up to the task of repairing the world? And where do you and I begin? In her fabulous book, The Beginning of Desire, which I referenced a few weeks ago, Aviva Gottlieb Zornberg, a reformed Hebrew scholar and author, offers a midrash from 300 BCE, filling in some of the unanswered questions about the story and offers an insight for us about where to begin to repair the world by first repairing the world within us. So according to the Midrash story, Abraham's father, Terak, owned a shop in which he sold idols. And young Abraham, realizing that a higher power must have created the universe, Abraham smashes the idols, leading his father to turn his own son, Abraham, over to King Nimrod for punishment. So King Nimrod and Abraham's father, Terak, arranged to burn Abraham to death in a furnace. But Abraham miraculously survived the three-day burning unscathed. And if he could survive this, then he certainly had the credentials to be the progenitor of the Jewish people. I think even more deeply, the story reveals something obvious about Abraham's psychological profile. Abraham himself was a victim of trauma by his own father. Now, during these ancient times, these patriarchal cultures, fathers had absolute authority, not only over their wives and their daughters, but over their sons who were considered property and could even be sacrificed if needed. And so now Abraham in fear and trembling wanders up until the very last moment, what God really has meant for him to do. And at that very last moment, when they reach the mountaintop, God clarifies to Abraham that he had intended to raise Isaac to the altar, not to kill him. According to the story, Abraham's father had condemned him to die in a furnace, a terrifying memory that Abraham, in order to survive childhood, needed to repress. And given who he was and all that he had gone through, perhaps there was no other way that Abraham could have understood God's instruction. Of course, he would hear it as instructions to kill his son. And yet somehow, despite this trauma, Abraham evolves, develops, grows more conscious spiritually and psychologically. He grows enough to hear the angel calling him, stopping him before it's too late. Abraham is now able, without a second to spare, able to understand and comprehend a new and different meaning to God's mission. To raise up his son means to bring Isaac to the mountain, to return him to God, because he is in fact God's child. But that the killing is unnecessary. He surrenders. He's able to interpret the prophecy now because he is in a different place psychologically. He literally sees and hears anew. And this is what the story of Abraham reveals. Abraham is now capable of understanding. In a sense, as I see it, the binding of Isaac, in a sense, is the story of the abused child almost becoming an abuser becoming psychologically repaired within, healed and awoke enough from his own trauma so that finally, before it's too late, he's able to stop the cycle of abuse. 
the murder, the attempt of murder. He's able to hear the voice of the angel, which I believe was within his own consciousness. Abraham, lay not thy hand upon thy lad, for now I know that thou fearest God. An angel cannot be late, but human beings made of flesh and blood may be. And so how do we repair the violence of the world before it's too late? The Midrash story today suggests that the first step of the journey is internal. In order to repair the violence and the poverty of the world, we must first repair the violence and the poverty within ourselves. We must listen to the voices of the angels first within us, restoring us internally back to life, back to wholeness, healing us of our own hidden, repressed experiences of trauma that strengthens us enough to go out into the world and hear the, listen to the voices of the angels calling us in turn to restore the world, listening to the voice of the prophets, the eternal voices that live on in us, the voice of Micah saying, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice? to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The voice of Amos saying, let justice well up like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. The voice of Jesus quoting his beloved Isaiah in his very first sermon, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. God has anointed me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. I believe that God is our partner in this journey, both within and outside, leading us to a better place. It's not going to be easy. It will involve both travel and travail, unpacking the myths the dreams we've been sold, and the nightmare that we have been living with within this patriarchy and within this country, this one nation under God. The angels remind us, fear not. God has the power to turn our weeping into laughing, our fear into fellowship, our violence into peace our division into unity, our wounds into transformed healers, and our savage inequality into amazing grace for all. As we together join in the work of repairing and healing and reconciling this broken world, may we begin together now before it's too late. Amen. And we'll now hear our sermon response. <clears throat> Oh, 
And so now hear these words of blessing called Tikkun Olam, the repair of the world, a prayer that is read often, especially during Rosh Hashanah. It is upon us to praise the sovereign of the universe and to proclaim the greatness of the creator who has set among us the other families of the earth giving us the opportunity to see the world through your eyes. Let the time not be distant, O oh God, when all shall return to you in love, when all the brokenness in our world is repaired by the work of our hands and hearts and inspired by your words. O oh, may all created in your image become one in spirit, and one in friendship, forever united in your service. Therefore, we bow in awe and thanksgiving. Amen.